Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Philosophy of Voluntarism, Episode 3, with me, Danilo Cuellar, from PeacefulAnarchism.com, and Jim Limber Davis of JimLimberDavis.com and Facebook.com slash Liberty Defined. He is the author of Liberty Defined and Morality Defined eBooks. Uh, you can also find this show on, on the Voluntary Virtues Network, on theconsciousresistance.com, on thesedsofliberty.com, and peacefulanarchism.com. So the um, philosophy, philosophy of voluntarism is covered by the BIPCOT No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bipcot.org. So today we're going to talk about the unintended consequences of taxation. Uh, that lovely time of the year actually we are doing this around tax season which is pretty apropos <laughs> what, what a coincidence what a lovely coincidence in, in other words the, the the time where uh people have to cough up the the innards of their uh financial organism these <laughs> are that which is caesar's right exactly start off with this since uh, it, this was your idea of having uh of having this topic find basic taxation what it is and you see as the uh, the unintended consequences. Okay, so uh, taxation. It, nobody seems to like them, uh, except for when they have to just do defend their philosophical position on why they rather pay taxes than have to actually do anything else other than make that happen. So, a taxation. It's real trendy and thrifty to, or hipster, I guess, to say taxation is theft in a lot of circles, but. No, people, not everybody realizes what taxation really is and why it is theft. In order to get it to that, we need to understand what consent is. We need to understand what self-ownership is and all those things there. But we'll save that. Uh, we already got into self-ownership in a previous episode. I think that was our first episode. So basically it's all about consent. And a lot of people like to say that taxation is voluntary in so far as that you can – well, just exit the jurisdiction of the government imposing the taxes. Well – that's not really much of an argument considering the fact that so many times we, we can leave, but where are we going to go? I mean we can't build an underwater city even if we do have the technology and get away from government because government's going to follow us. We can't go to Antarctica because that's just not reasonable. We can't just leave. We can't get off this rock. It's not like we can create our own space program and then, and then go off and, and colonize something else. Right now it's just not cost effective, and then two – the government have the governments heavily regulate everything that has to do with anything with airspace. So basically, it becomes a issue of well, why do we have to drive on the roads? Well, because the government monopolizes everything. So the government controls and regulates airspace, water space, roadways, everything. We can't do anything. They're just going to follow us around. So the whole idea with taxation being theft is that it's not consensual. There is no point in time where taxation is ever consensual because if it was, then the, bis then the governments would be businesses. They would be things that we don't have to. It would be voluntary in the, in the sense that, hey, welcome to Big Box Mart. Okay, do you know what? You guys gave me crappy service last time. I'm going to the smaller box store over there. But taxation doesn't work that way. It's not like we can go to the non-taxing entity just by going someplace else. I mean, big box mart's going to laugh at us if we don't want to pay the seven cents on a soda or whatever at the end of the checkout. They're going to be like, pay the tax or get out. We're not going to play that. We're not going to do that because government's going to come in and shut them down. If they don't pay the taxes, they're going to shut the entire operation down. Then if you're at a big box store, you, know, you maybe have 200 people working there. None of, none of those people are going to have jobs if the store is shut down. So it's, it's extortion. It's taxation. It's theft. It's, theft. it's just the problem. So the whole idea with taxation then becomes an issue of understanding what wealth is. My take on this, and I've talked about this a number of times in other, uh, in other venues that I have put out there, and the, the whole issue with taxation is that taxation ends up becoming something very interesting. Taxation is something that 
in, inadvertently creates a tragedy of the commons of sorts with whatever is made to be legal tender. So everything that taxation does, it basically makes it so that all real wealth – that if you're interested in understanding what real wealth is, you can download my free ebook, Liberty to Find, and get into that. You only have to read the first couple of chapters in order to understand that. But what happens with taxation is, is it takes everything that's real wealth, everything that we can create to satisfy our sustenance, our needs for sustenance, shelter, security, and happiness, and makes it so that we have to turn some of that, if not all of it, depending on which government regime you're living under, says to, to make that into what is there ever is useful for paying the tax debts levied upon you. So if we want to continue to exist, then we need to take whatever we created, whether we farmed it, whether we grew it, whether we, we created it, whether we chopped it down out of a forest, whatever it is, and take that, trade it, get some sort of, of currency or money that is useful for satisfying those tax debts, and then give it to the taxman. And that's just that's just the start of this. And this is going to be a very complex topic. It's not something that I think a lot of people are going to pick up on right off the bat. So again, if any time anyone listening feels as if they are hearing something that doesn't quite make sense, just please take an afternoon to read the first couple of chapters of my book, Liberty to Find. Um, just reading those first couple of chapters will help clarify the differences between what I consider real wealth and artificial wealth, what gives wealth value, and, and so on. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I definitely agree with that sentiment. So taxation to me is one of the foundational euphemisms that underlies the state. And that is basically the lifeblood of the state that powers it in addition to obedience, compliance, and the belief in authority. Yeah. Taxation. Uh, so like so many political euphemisms, the common anarchist volunteers refrain is taxation is theft, but ju just like war is mass murder or, you know, getting pulled over by the police is a death threat or the, the war on drugs is kidnapping. Uh, <laughs> so there's so many political euphemisms. Quantitative easing is just counterfeiting. And, and and the way I describe it to people is because for me, taxation is theft is just too direct, too, too much, too much of a blunt statement to tell people. I like to kind of ease myself into that, into that assertion um, by first asking people, um, you know, do you own yourself? Do you control your body? And if you do, most people say yes. Uh, then you say, well, what about the fruits of your labor? Would you own that? Yes. And, and so if the state claims a portion of the fruits of your labor against your will, is that not theft? And if they do so, if they do claim that, no, actually I have to give, pay my taxes, you know, uh, because that's how society must function, right? Then you are essentially saying that part of you is owned by the state or by politicians, which is a very scary thing for a person to admit, right? It's like a, you know, it's not outright slavery, but it's, it's a you know, small percentage, right? It's like, it's like if 0% taxation is complete freedom and hundred percent taxation is chain slavery, at which point is it not slavery? Right. And, and I would argue that at no point is it not slavery, right? Because even if you are compelled to give a dollar, if you do not give that dollar, right, because every law is backed by a gun, then there will be consequences, right? So, so, um, taxation, like any law, like any regulation, there is no compromise with, right? There's no compromise, no peaceful resolution with the state. It's not, it's not a request, right? The police officer doesn't turn on his lights and request <laughs> you to pull over. It's a demand, right? It's a, it's a command. So, so yeah, so taxation is definitely a theft is violence, you know, is, is, um, extortion, right? So what happens, you know, now we're talking about the unintended consequences, right? So also another way I like to look at it is the, um, the broken window fallacy in that to say the state is a broken window fallacy writ large and taxation, you know, is the forceful redistribution of wealth or, or, or currency from the productive people 
to the non-productive people now. And when I say non-productive, I don't only mean like welfare recipients, <laughs> you know, anybody receiving a pension or whatever, but I also mean politicians and bureaucrats, right? <laughs> so it's a diversion of productive, productive resources and they're used, they're transferred by force and they're used in ways that the market does not want or need. They're used arbitrarily for whatever whims the politicians want them to be used for. And the most, the largest reason would be for military endeavors, right? The war in the Middle East or occupations or various invasions or drone strikes or, or what have you, whatever, whatever they think will secure their power and their influence over, over other nations. So. And, and it's very unfortunate. So, you know, you know, in one sense, we say that I could see some anarchists accusing other anarchists who do pay taxes saying, you know, you're a hypocrite because you pay taxes and how could you do that? You have blood on your hands and that's true. But at the same time, you have to consider self-preservation in that we all value our lives and we are much more useful in the, in the public rather than behind bars or maimed, injured, or dead, right? We can be much more use out in the world, producing things of value, even though a portion of that is stolen, um, without our consent by force, right? So it's not really hy hypocritical. I think it's more out of self-preservation. Of course, there are ways that we can live our lives to minimize that theft. And I think, I think many anarchists and volunteers attempt to do that and that's commendable. But to uh, deride some anarchists for paying taxes, I think, is just uh, counterproductive. So. Oh, no, that's definitely something I agree with. The hip being hypocritical for paying taxes, you absolutely have to pick your own battles. Right. In fact, I did a uh, episode for my Liberty Defined Facebook page titled uh, The Burden of Being an Enlightened Tax Slave, and I get all into that. So that's something that a lot of people, they just automatically assume, oh, well, give up taxes. You can't do that because... No matter what you do, you're still going to have to be part of it. You can't just give everything up. It's something that has to be eased out of. Now, if the government were to suddenly take something out of circulation, say like in the 1870s, I think it was uh, 72, where the president at the time, I think it was Grant. I think it was Grant. Uh, he demonetized silver, took silver out of circulation, and people still use silver. They had to. They had no other choice. Basically, he took something, what, I don't know, something along the lines of 40, 50 percent of the money in circulation at the time, which was silver, mm -hmm. and demonetized it. So people were scrambling around to get that in order to pay whatever taxes they needed to. I mean, that's – it's difficult to handle, but it, it, it can be done, but it's not likely to be done. And silver was still in use for 10 years after that is being traded. In order to get gold or whatever they needed to pay taxes at the time, where even if it was the greenbacks that were still being taken out of circulation at the time. But I want to go back to something you had mentioned, the broken window fallacy. Uh, I've talked about that too, uh, the broken window fallacy being the – at least from what I understand, the Federal Reserve or the centralized banking systems where it's just printing more of the same, uh, print more money, and the people who get the money first get the most value out of it because it hasn't filled with the economy to the – to the lowest man on the totem pole just yet, and that works very well with a tragedy of the commons. But how this makes sense as far as I'm concerned is that when taxes are imposed, it takes all of the potential wealth that someone can create, all the potential real wealth, the real wealth that is useful for satisfying one's needs for sustenance, shelter, security, and happiness, the needs of which give it value, give wealth value. It takes all of that and makes it so that people have to funnel it through whatever currency is useful for paying those taxes. And when those taxes have to are, in, are imposed and people have to pay them, they now have to refine a portion of their life that they cannot get back, that must be transformed into whatever it is Uncle Sam or whoever it is that they have to pay gets. And that's something that really hurts. So basically, if we were to draw a big, huge circle, and, the, and in this circle is everything that an individual can potentially create because everything that we do, whether it's just you and I standing here or sitting here talking to each other about this 
or us going out into the woods to pick up a bunch of sticks to turn into kindling to start a fire or to sell to a baker down the street if this was 1540 in order so he can have a fire to bake his goods. Whatever it is that we do, whether we go – even if we're just going to our nine-to-five job and selling our labor for eight hours a day to – produce TPS reports for our employer so that he could tell us that we have to come in on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, it's all real wealth. We are producing something that satisfies our sustenance, shelter, security, and our happiness. In the case of a nine to five job, we're actually refining our three natural resources, our time, our intellect, and our labor in order to acquire money or currency. We do that and then we take that and we trade that for food for our sustenance, our shelter, and our security, and our happiness after we're done working our nine-to-five each day. The issue here is that we can no longer take – everything in that circle gets reduced, maybe 90 percent, maybe 10 percent, anything in between. But our ability to produce and create real wealth and to keep it is diminished based on whatever it is that the government does in or whatever currency they want. So if the government were to implement a tax policy that says everything must be paid in gold, well, gold is going to suddenly be given a little bit boost in value because now gold – not only is, is gold – does it have intrinsic value, but it now also has artificial value in the sense that, hey, look, if I acquire this and I give it to that tax guy over there, I'll be able to stay the violent hand of his employer, meaning that – his employer is not going to come and collect me, threaten me to get into a cage, and hold me in a cage for however long they see fit to teach me a lesson so that I'm going to be more compliant, more obedient. That's one of those unintended consequences of taxation that people don't realize. People don't think about this sort of stuff when taxes are imposed. Now, what about when the Federal Reserve comes around and they start making Federal Reserve notes? Same thing, same concept. The only difference is it's the worthless paper that we have to carry around. That's not helpful to us. That's having us not only use something that already had no value to begin with, but now is completely based on the artificial value of staying the violent hand of government. Why? That does nothing to help us whatsoever. It actually does more to hurt us because it makes it so that we – no longer have that time that we were using to create something that could be useful for satisfying our needs for sustenance, shelter, security, and happiness. We don't have that. It's gone forever because we needed to refine our time, intellect, and labor to create something so we can sell a portion of that in order to acquire whatever it is that, that Uncle Sam or Johnny Rev wanted for satisfying tax debts so that it could be transferred into that. And then squandered on stuff that we have no control over. So that's that's just something else that goes in there. And then this doesn't even get into the idea of regulations either. So that's – there's so much to cover with the unintended consequences of taxation that this could probably be a 10-year long program alone, I think. <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> That'd be fun editing, right? <laughs> uh, I do all the editing for this. No. <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah, the broken window policy is really is really a great example of discussing this because I think I can see how some people who support the state can view taxation as legitimate when they see these structures that are built like let's say bridges, tunnels, dams, roads they see, or you know, even buildings, right? Like public school buildings, let's say, or whatever, the government buildings that are paid for through this coercively redistributed funds. And they see, you see, look at these roads, look at these bridges, look at these tunnels. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That's why we need taxation, so we can build these wonderful things. But it it comes back to the the idea of the uh, the seen versus the unseen, right? And what they see are those physical structures, but what they do not see was the potential that could have been created that was destroyed because those funds were coercively redistributed, and and they and they were they were made those things those unseen objects were made impossible 
because the people who perhaps would have gotten a massage or gotten a new car or taken their taking their family out to dinner, to a movie or whatever, whatever they want to spend their money on to increase their happiness has not occurred, right? And so people are that much poorer, that much more unhappy. And, and also the fact that those structures were not built out of market demand. They weren't engaging in competition as to where, how, how do we determine where's the best place to put a bridge? Where's the best place to put a tunnel? There's, there's, no, real, there's no real feedback. There's no real measure of, um, or, or mechanism to determine what's the most efficient use of resources because we're dealing with the state. There is, there is no competition, right? And that's, right. There's, no, there's that, no competition with that. I, I think that this ends up becoming another artificially created demand. So you mm. mentioned the bridges and the, and the dams and the highways and all that. It ends up just becoming artificial demand to cover up illegitimate use of force to create a need in order to uh, use gold to pay for tax debts. It's just art of creating artificial demands. The government just goes through. They put it. They hold a gun to, pe to some people's heads in the beginning. So like if this was, say, 1780, they're holding a gun to the uh, importing merchants, collecting a tariff off of it. If you want to bring these goods within these borders here, you have to pay this right here. So they collect their gold coins off of the hundreds of, of tons of bales of cotton that they're bringing in or whatever they're – or rum or whatever they're doing and collecting that. And then they're taking the gold and saying, hey, look, we're going to build all this infrastructure up here. You guys need this. Then they get the next generation hooked on it, and they say, hey, look, we can't get rid of this. We need these highways. We need these roads. And that's how I think that they get it hooked on. And a lot of, a lot of people, like you were saying, they're like, well, we need this stuff. We need this stuff. That, but do they really need this, or is it just because they've been using it all their life now at this point? They don't know how to do otherwise. Yeah, yeah, it reminds uh, it reminds me of when I criticized government school, and then um, my family. I, you what? Criticize <laughs> government school? <laughs> yeah, but... Friendly, friendly show. I thought <laughs> when I criticize government school, my family turns around and says, "How can you criticize government? Or how can you criticize your public school experience?" You know, look at you. You're a success in life, right? You got kids, you got a beautiful wife, you got a nice profession. You know, you're a smart, intellectual guy. How can you criticize? That's what it, it made you who you are. And the idea, again, seen versus the unseen. They see how I am now. And, and to me, a, a kind of an analogy is basically saying, if a person as a child got abused, you know, let's say physically abused as a child, and yet they went through years of, of turmoil and suffering and, you know, self-doubt. And then eventually through, through um, working on themselves, have overcome all that and later, you know, started a business and became successful. Then they would say, you see, you see, look how successful you are. That's because of your past, <laughs> because you got to, isn't that a wonderful thing? <laughs> so, so it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, right? It's like, because there was this uh, force, this coercion in the past, i.e. government school, where you have no choice, you must go to this institution, you must learn these things, you must memorize these things and regurgitate them on tests and perform. And if you don't, if you, if you don't, you will be punished, right? So that was, there was no choice. There was no consent with that. So really the question is, that should be asked is where would I have been if I had the choice of what to, to what to spend my time on throughout those 12 years? Where would I have been? How much greater could I have achieved? How many more greater things could I have achieved, right? And so the same thing with taxation. If that money was not stolen, how much wealthier of a society would we be? You know, people say we need, we need the roads you know, we, we need, need the government to make roads, right? Because, you know, we have cars and cars need roads. Well, maybe <laughs> if they weren't monopolized by now, maybe the, and, and the market was freed, perhaps we wouldn't even need roads. Perhaps we would have <laughs> flying cars or, or evacuated, what, what is that called? The uh, evacuated tubes for the trains. You know, we, we, we I think there, there is no way to tell or to measure the amount of prosperity that has been annihilated because of all this coercion that has been uh, inflicted upon the human condition by control freaks. 
and then those people who believe them to be legitimate, right? I think it's the, it is the job of the anarchists and the voluntarists to point out the gun in the room, right? And say, no, this is not taxation. This is not just something fun. You know, it's not just a quote by Benjamin Franklin. Um, you know, the only thing certain in life is death and taxes. No, it's extortion. It's violence. It's theft. You don't owe a portion of your income to politicians. They don't control you. No, that's completely illegitimate. And I think the more people can realize that, the quicker will be the demise of uh, of this idea of statism that uh, that some people have a, a legitimate right to control other human beings. So, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned the background getting from going to public schools and being raised and all that to being criticized about now criticizing public schools. There, there was a picture I've seen uh, frequently. It's this, it's got a two panels in it and one has a straight path with a stick figure on a bicycle going to a finish line. And then the next picture has a stick figure on a bicycle with all sorts of different obstacles between where they're at and the finish line. And that's really throwing in a school, a government school lecture or 12 years of that plus taxation and all the regulations and all the hoops an individual has to jump through, it, it ends up being more like a horrific 15, 20 year obstacle course that somebody has to jump all the, jump all through all the hoops and do all this extra stuff here that would have otherwise maybe been unnecessary in order to create an end product where they are not only a productive member of whatever portion of society they're a part of, but that they're also far ahead of where they otherwise would have been if government may have just stepped out of the way. That is not a guarantee that we would be better off without government. It's just a, hey, let's point out that vicious, violent elephant in the room with the bad toupee, this <laughs> one, uh, you know, and get, get, let's see what happens. Let's just see what happens. So I'm not sure a lot of people quite look at it that way, you know. As we get – as we move on, we start talking about these things more and more frequently. We get more ideas out there, and we give people a chance to, hey, not necessarily just, hey, put themselves on defense right away because I think that's something else that a lot of self-proclaimed anarchists and voluntarists end up doing that hurts the cause more often than not is that they tend to argue with other people instead of just discussing things with other people. Mm. And so – we talk about the whole taxation is theft deal. Yeah, taxation is theft. Why? Why is taxation theft? What does that theft do? What happens with all of the unintended consequences of it? What happens with the money that didn't get spent to buy new clothes? What happens with the money that had to go towards paying for whatever it is that the bridge is to nowhere is going to be placed at? What happens with all of that? What happens to all the little kids now who – aren't able to learn how to ride a boat because the regulations for riding a boat in some areas or acquiring a boat in some areas are far more strict than it is for actually having an automobile. You know, so all these things, all taxation does is just put additional barriers there. It's one barrier after another barrier after another barrier where – like I live in Indiana on the Ohio River currently, and if I wanted to get to my 9 to 5 job, across the river, I could actually sh probably shave 15, 20 minutes off of my commute time if I was able to take a ferry from the dock in my town across the way into Kentucky. That would be great. That would save me 15, 20 minutes. I could, I could ride my bike the rest of the way. No problem. I, it would be more environmentally friendly to do that. And I could, I would be able to save money on not having to worry about my vehicle, not having to pay gasoline. All I would do is just pay 50 cents, a dollar, have the guy float me across the river. Bam, done. But I can't do that because the unintended consequences of taxation say, nope, government's going to provide a monopoly on this. Everybody's going to do the same thing. What happens to be the same thing? Everybody has to drive. Everybody has to drive or use public transportation, which is always dependable. But I could – I could easily have a business right here or somebody else in my town could have a business and put me on a raft and float me across and bam, done. 
but that's something that is not possible because of the way taxation is implemented and what the what is done with the revenue generated from taxing people, stealing from people, holding a gun to their heads and saying it's benevolent. There's so much, so much that people don't realize that happens with taxation that at the end of the day, people just – they don't want to – they just want to bury their heads in the sand because they can't possibly fathom sometimes. And when they do, they just make these justifications for being governed due to a lack of fully understanding what they're submitting to. They just get into the whole, you know what, I, I don't really want to think about this. I'd rather just go with the easy way out, the popular way out. I just don't want to be bothered with it. I'm already working hard enough. I'll just work at a couple of extra hours at my job, and then that way I'll have the money that was missing. But if you go ask somebody, well, what do you make? Well, after taxes. No, 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 not after taxes. <laughs> right. what, hey, <laughs> what do you make? Well, uh, no, not after taxes. I want to know what you make. You make $10 an hour, and you work 10 hours a week. I don't want to know your after-tax amount. I want to know what you make, $100. Well, after taxes, I only make 91 But no, you earned $100. <laughs> the government took $9 from you. That's that's very simplified. But what if you make fifty thousand dollars a year? That's what you're supposed to make, and the government puts you in a tax bracket, and now you're only making thirty six thousand dollars a year. That's a lot of money. That would go very far. Now in California, that won't go very far, but in <laughs> Indiana and a lot of the other rural states, that goes a very long way. When when you can get rent for an apartment in an area like where I'm at for four or five hundred dollars a month. And sometimes get water included. Sometimes get internet, electric, or internet and cable included. Thirty-six thousand dollars versus fifty thousand dollars. That's almost a brand new, low-end luxury car right there mm -hmm. every year. So that right there, broken window fallacy. What does taxation do? Steals money that we couldn't have. So or steals steals wealth that we that we don't know we could have had mm -hmm. otherwise. I know I know quite a few entrepreneurs, and uh, one of them that I know is a pretty good friend. He's also an anarchist and volunteerist, and uh, one of the few people that I know in person that I that I'm uh, live pretty close to, and that, that's an uh, that's an anarchist. And he he was telling me he has a food truck. He's a chef, right? He has a food truck, and he says that the biggest overhead that he has is taxation. And, and regulation, but you know, just uh, paying out of pocket taxation directly, and uh, you know, it's annoying. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like constant, constant, like you know, siphoning away valuable resources, siphoning away, siphoning. You gotta always think about, you know, what are my taxes? What are my taxes? And also, I, I interviewed recently, uh, posted on my channel, an interview with uh, Chef Marcello. He is an Italian chef, and he owns a couple of restaurants. And he was talking about taxation too. He's not an anarchist, <laughs> but but uh, he did say on my recording. Basically, he said it's theft. You know, politicians just stealing from the poor, stealing from the poor. Yeah, and it's and it's very unfortunate that there's like this debate. You know, progressive. You know, what's better, progressive tax or a flat tax or you know, graduated tax? You know, what's better? You know, how how do we how do we reconstruct this grotesquerie? that's called taxation to make it into a beautiful object <laughs> to make it into a nice flower. <laughs> How can we, you know, what words can we add to it? <laughs> to you go back to the 1980s and say, just say no to taxation. <laughs> I don't know, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, and, and actually my friend with the food truck, he was telling me that one of the best people to reach out to, in terms of uh, helping them to understand the idea of anarchism and volunteerism is entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs because they intimately understand how burdensome and difficult it is to open a business and comply simultaneously with all these regulations and taxes. It's very difficult. And actually, I, I remember hearing, I think I remember Luis Mises from The Emancipated Human. He mentioned how uh, he met some of the CEOs of like Potley and Starbucks and Subway. I think I remember hearing, yeah, how they say that if they were to start their business today, they wouldn't be able to start it. <laughs> and the same thing with, with my friend, 
the chef, Chef Marcello, the uh, the Italian chef, he says he started his business like 20 years ago. But he's like, if, we, if he started today, he wouldn't be able to start it. So many taxes, so much more regulation. He's like, you know, we didn't have to, you know, back in the 80s, the early 90s, we didn't have to put in, you know, handicap. We didn't have to put in sprinklers. We didn't have to put in any of this crap. And it was a lot easier to start a business as opposed to now. And the trajectory does not seem like it's getting any easier. So by increasing all this burden on the entrepreneur, they are killing the goose that lays the golden egg. They are killing, killing the prosperity that drives economic wealth and just, you know, wealth in general. So, Oh, that's, that's the food truck thing is something that I tried to do a few years ago. And here in Indiana, where I live, that's, I wanted to create a mobile food cart is what I was going to do. And I was going to take it around and take it to all the local events and the festivals and stuff that happens around here. And then I found out that they charge semi-annual property taxes on used equipment that I bought. Oh, they were going to appraise the equipment that I got as if it was brand new when the equipment was already almost 10 years old when I tried to when I acquired it. Wow. Then they wanted to charge that sales tax to me twice a year. Oof. And if they failed to pay, they were going to confiscate the equipment, get what they can out of it and tell me do that again and you get 30 days in lockup. Wow. Ridiculous. Yeah. All I tried to create my own business, and this was this was about 2000, 2010 or so. That was that's ridiculous. And I, what kills me is I don't understand why it takes somebody starting their own business to understand that better than somebody who earns the fifty thousand dollars a year and only brings home thirty six thousand. Mm -hmm. It's like what do you think is going to happen? What, what what do they think happens with the money? I don't understand why people just don't pay attention to that. I guess maybe they just well, it's just the way things are. It's just the way things are. It's easier to just, I suppose, for so many people to simply live, you know, head down, don't make trouble, don't get targeted. It's basically one of the reasons why I suppose my folks don't talk to me as much anymore. Actually, they don't talk to me at all because they were state employees for 30, 40 years. And they don't like, I suppose, the direction that I've taken a lot of the things that I'm discussing now. And they just believe that. So my dad will tell me he'll say, "You need to stop with this with this anarchism stuff. You're going to get in trouble for it." I'm like, wait a minute. So you know that there is issue with government, but you don't want to be the person to do anything about it. You want somebody else to do something about it, but you don't want to attract any attention to you because you know that the gulag is. Only one step away if somebody in power doesn't like what your son is doing. Mm. Well, people are afraid, and I think the biggest issue is that, one, people are nescient. They don't know any better, and two, they're afraid. And when you have people who don't know any better and they're afraid of not just the potential what-ifs the rest of the world can do, like ISIS and maybe China or those evil Canadians. You know, I'm just kidding. If you're from Canada, I'm not really. <laughs> I don't. I don't think ill of you guys. But uh, I'm just saying. You know, people are worried about all these invasions coming in, but then they're also afraid of the of being retaliated against for non-compliance with local laws, meaning local from everything from federal to state and their little local municipalities and whatever else. So it's it's a double whammy on fear. Don't pay the taxes. Men in black, not the alien kinds, come and get you. You don't pay your taxes on a local level, then you have to go to you have to go to lockup or whatever. The local sheriff's deputies come and get you. I mean, there's fear everywhere, and it's always about compliance. Uh, you don't comply. It's for the greater good. But when a cop shows up or a law enforcement agent shows up and they're got their lights on and they're behind you, and you don't pull over because Oh, good. I'm going to be safe. He's going to let me know my tail lights out or something. <laughs> you pull over because you know that the moment that you don't comply with pulling over, they are going to assume that you're even worse than they really are, make something of it, and going to use potentially deadly force against you. It's always fear based, and that's all taxation does. It creates a culture of fear, a culture of authoritarianism, a culture where 
the person in the highest office yells and screams and makes uh, horrendous demands of the person below them, and then it just cycles all the way down. It gets to the it goes to the employers. The employers have to they do the same thing. You don't do what I tell you to do. I'm going to fire you. And if you don't want to be fired and laid off and lose your house because you can't pay the property taxes on it, then you're going to do what I tell you to do. And then it goes home. It goes to the family, and then it goes to the children, and it goes to the pets. And it's just that's where this comes from. It's always a culture of fear, fear, fear. And it's something that a lot of people don't really want to discuss. Or if they do discuss it, they blame other things. Like they blame capitalism for this. And it's not even – capitalism's fault capitalism was hijacked all capitalism ends up being is just free trade and what does free trade mean what does free enterprise mean it means the ability to exchange goods services ideas and wealth real and artificial in order to achieve or to to acquire whatever it is that you want in exchange without having the interjection of unwarranted interference that's all it is. That's all free enterprise, free trade is. And because taxation actually ends up making it so that so that the, you have to comply, every single transaction ends up becoming not free trade or less free trade. And it's not something that we can get away with. So until taxation is completely rejected by the masses, everything that we do, nothing we do. Is going to be free of coercion and inter unwarranted interference. So, if so, let's just take for example, during the 1850s, when we had all the imports. So, southern colonies were sending out goods, cotton, all sorts of stuff all over the world. Well, if they wanted to bring in goods and services or other goods and services, they would have to pay a tax. Well, if that tax was demanded in gold coins exclusively. Then they would have to do one of a couple of things. One, demand all payments for their goods that they're bringing in in gold coins, and or two, they would have to take some payment in gold coin or take whatever payments they do get and then pay a fee to convert those into others or take an extra step to convert that wealth, that money, that currency into gold coins so that they could pay those tariffs demanded of them. So it adds – taxation adds extra steps to every single process that we do, and if you have an extra step, that's somehow going to become wasteful in the end, especially if you have to do – if you so let's just say if you do a million transactions in a day, and that waste ends up being half of a cent. Well, do the math. That's hundreds of, hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars. Tens of thousands of whatever it is that you lost because of that transaction, and when that happens for years and years and years, we completely out. We what could we what could we have done with all of that? It's just so much that people miss, and it's it's disheartening that mo more people don't pay attention to this. Yeah, another way that I I like to think about the state and uh, taxation is the economy or the productive individuals are let's say you know an animal or a person that's just going about being productive and then you have a tick <laughs> that fastens itself onto the animal or the human and just begins you know siphoning off blood siphoning off blood and the tick grows bigger and grows larger at the expense of the host. It doesn't contribute anything. It just siphons away productivity and wealth. And so, you know, people, it's, it's funny how people are scared of how human beings would be without the state when it is in fact the quite the reverse. <laughs> it is, it is the politicians and the bureaucrats that need the productive individuals, right? It's always productivity that precedes predation, right? You must have it that way, <laughs> right? You, first, you have to have a prosperous society on which will attract these control freaks that want a piece of it and bring in their goons, their guns, um, and conquer them. And then 
eventually, after generations have passed the establishment of government school, they would teach the people that not only are they not goons and and not aggressors, but they are their benefactors, their protectors, and they are entirely legitimate and necessary. That's a really difficult myth to dispel, but I think that's our job, <laughs> is to pull the veil away and reveal the wickedness underneath. And slowly, with each you know each article that we write, each video that we post and, uh, and, and upload, we are doing a little bit more. We're con contributing to the great wealth of knowledge, you know, helping to make the world a better place by demonstrating that no, we do not need the parasitic class. We do not need them, you know, any more than, you know, the host needs a tick or a tapeworm. <laughs> so it, it's a very important distinction between the productive and the parasite. And, and also that reminds me of another a, a Tolstoy quote is, um, I, I sit on a man's back and I, I, uh, console him that I will do anything I can to rid him of, of this burden, except to get off his back. <laughs> that's very fitting. Now that's uh, something that uh, government ends up being taxation and government. It's nothing but an unnecessary middleman. We don't need it. I think Something that I've said for quite a while now is that government is an ant antiquated idea for a lesser civilized period of humanity's uh, history. And at first glance, I think government and pooling resources through force and coercion is an idea that is befitting people who do not typically think through or create their own philosophical position – in terms of maximizing the potential of future returns through voluntary interactions with people today. That's a, that, I know that's a lot to think about all in one breath, yet it's something that more people need to think about. Because every time that we choose a voluntary interaction with somebody where we accept the response of no, what we're doing is we're showing them respect for the value that they've placed upon their lives. We're letting them know that we respect that. And when people say, well, we want government and we respect the value that you place on your life, but we need government, they don't understand entirely what they're getting at. And if they do understand, then they are lying and choosing to say, I don't want to be wrong. So I'm going to protect my pride about being wrong, tell you that I do understand, and I'm going to just – Nope, I'm not even going to listen to you anymore because you obviously don't care that I'm trying to do something good. Intent and means are two separate things. The intent has to be clear, but the means also have to match the intent. And when people say that they want taxation, they're not paying attention to why those means are destructive, how those means are destructive. And what is being destroyed? They have no idea. And I don't think people are going to start recognizing this en masse until they see the government for what it really is. And all government ends up being, again, is just nothing but an unnecessary middleman who went around fear-mongering, maybe in some cases. But in other cases, it was a legit means to achieving peace and security. But at what cost? It's always the cost that has to be looked at, and that cost is never looked at as efficiently as it could be simply because most of the people championing government are not able to clearly produce a absolutely transparent path of thought progression from what they want, how to achieve that, and then getting all the way back to that goal of what it is that they're looking for. They just don't do that. They just accept it for what it is, and they're constantly choosing to do other things. Like I don't have time to listen to this podcast by these anarchists because I have a job to do in the real world. I need to pay my bills. Now, well, I understand you need to pay your bills, but why do you have to pay all of those bills? Is it because government took 30% of your income? Is it because maybe government took – $14,000 of your $50,000 salary 
and now you have to work extra hours because you could have otherwise paid your phone bill no problem or had that new car repair done? Is it because of those things there? Or is it, you know, what is it that people don't, why, why do they not want to pay attention to this? There's always some reason. They scapegoat everything but themselves. And a lot of people say, oh, it's really nice if you want to go ahead and just blame everybody else for being the problem in your life. Uh, I'm not blaming you guys. I'm fixing things. I'm not taking a single dime from the government, not for welfare, not for anything. Even when I did need it almost 10 years ago, I didn't take I didn't take hardly anything once I realized, once I had that epiphany, that taxation is actually theft. Once I had that, nope, I cut it all off because standing in the line for getting a government check for being on, on unemployment, it was weird. I didn't like the quality of the character of people that I was in line with. And I started looking at other things. I was very uncomfortable, and a lot of these people were just – a lot of them were really nice, and then some of them were give me, give me, give me. There's all sorts of people that were in those lines there, and that made me do a lot of extra thinking. But what is it that makes people not want to think about these things? And it's always the same. It's always fear. It's fear of being different or even fear of not being accepted. And I think it's the fear of not being accepted because everybody seems to go out and vote and be a part of what they think is a solution without actually realizing that they're just being good little soldiers doing what they're told to do. Because they don't want to think about it until somebody else changes things for them. It's very burdensome sometimes to think about that. Yes, definitely. Um, you know, you, you mentioned about the poor, and and I, and I remember another, um, you know, another argument that certain statists say, which is, uh, you know, we need taxation in the welfare state, you know, to help the poor, help the needy, right? Uh, Got to give them this money. Um, they, you know, poor souls, you just found some bad luck and, 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 um, one, one question to ask those people is what made them poor? <laughs> I mean, it, sure. It could have been, could have been bad luck, just sheer bad luck. I don't think all of them are that way because of bad luck. Perhaps they were just, <laughs> you know, like we mentioned with the businesses, they were, they were prevented from producing, from being productive because of all of these taxation and, and regulations that they had to comply with and they just couldn't, right? So it impoverishes people. <laughs> so the, the supreme irony is taxation impoverishes people and then people say we need, we need to tax people <laughs> to, to, to give to the poor. <laughs> and it reminds me of a, a Thomas Sowell quote which says the welfare state is stealthily stealing from productive people and then bombastically giving it or flamboyantly giving it back to them. <laughs> I, yeah, I heard that. That's a great, that's a great piece. I don't remember what piece, what, where that was at, but uh, that was fantastic. I remember that when I, when I first read that. Yeah. Yeah. One of my, one of my favorite quotes of, of his, I, I like, I like his stuff. And so, you know, if, if we re if people are really concerned with the poor, the first thing you have to do is stop stealing from them. <laughs> Allow them to be productive, right? It's like it's like if if the kid, you know, like around here it, it, it recently snowed and every time it snows, we get some these uh, these two teenagers that come by and they want to shovel our driveway for 10 or 20 dollars. I don't think they claim that. <laughs> I don't think they I don't know if their parents take a portion of that and to teach them about taxation. <laughs> I hope they don't. But if, if they knew that they could keep the full amount of that money, you can be sure that that would incentivize them to be even more productive and work even harder because they know they can keep everything. Whereas if they, if, if they know that, that a third of it will be stolen from them, that just destroys the incentive, right? It's like, it's like, you know, the, the state taxes, various goods like let's say alcohol or, or cigarettes because they want to dis they say they want to discourage people from doing that well what is income tax <laughs> what kind of message does that give <laughs> you know it's like it's like you're punished for being productive and then when you're not productive and you're on welfare you're rewarded for being unproductive <laughs> absolutely i love that question about what about the poor now well what about them i mean if taxes weren't imposed which then go to enforce regulations and everything else, well, then these same poor people, they could easily save up by just doing 
day labor positions, and they could own their own little tiny plot of land without question. They wouldn't have to worry about paying that thousand dollar tax property bill, you know, every year or every every twice a year. They could build their own home without regulations. They could grow their own food. They could collect their own water. They could build their own small solar or water generating plant on their own property. They could do so many things and not have to be beholden to the almighty dollar or the euro or whatever it is that they have. They could they could have a plot of land and do everything that they need on that plot of land potentially and never have to leave. But we can't do that. We can't do that because government has to have a say. They have to be beholden to the collective. They have to pay taxes that go to putting other people's children into school. And the argument about you have to pay taxes because it's civilized. Well, there's nothing civilized about holding somebody hostage for paying something to help somebody else out. Well, I'm terribly sorry that what's her name down the street decided to have 12 children. <laughs> That's not my fault. <laughs> now, I'm not saying I'm not compassionate. I don't care about the well-being of this lady and her family and her 12 kids. I'm simply saying there are choices. There's context that needs to be looked at. Now, maybe she was a victim of something, in which case, if I can afford it and I can bring some, maybe bring some cabbages or some fresh vegetables out of my garden down to help her out so she can cook a meal, okay. But don't hold me hostage with my freedom because somebody else asked somebody else who got together with a big group and decided to form a commune that then turned into a government that then told me that if I don't like it, I can leave. That's not okay, and that's that's what happens when government does these things. They, they hurt the poor by making them dependent. They hurt the poor by taking away their freedom to build a house without regulation, to own property without having to pay taxes on it, to, without having to, to pay what amounts to being rent. They hold them hostage with regulations where they can't grow their own food. They hold them hostage where they can't collect water that falls on their property. They, <laughs> that's what government and taxation does. They hold people hostage. And poor people would be so much easier to do exactly what the Republicans say. And some Democrats, but a lot of Republicans, they say, well, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Right. You can't do that. <laughs> you can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps because, again, you can't own a piece of property without having to pay rent that's called taxes, annual or semi-annual. You can't grow a garden on your property without having to make sure it's okay with your local city ordinances. You can't collect rainwater off of your property in certain states. I mean then you have to – you can't build a house. I mean you can't live in a tent on your own property in the middle of, in the, middle of the city because it's for whatever reason unsafe somehow. I mean there's that, – that's all government does. It's just that it hurts people. What about the poor? I would love to help the poor. But unfortunately, I have this old guy with a beard who's smiling at me and pointing a gun at me behind a piece of paper called the Constitution or whatever each individual state's paper is called saying I have to pay this whenever I shop in those states or whenever I travel or whenever I decide to live in them. And I would help more people if I could, but – I'm sorry. Too many people demand we have the centralized set of authorities and say, hey, look, you comply or get out. OK, I, I would love to not have to worry about this and I would like to get out. Yes. But where am I going to go? I don't want to. I wouldn't mind Canada, but I don't really want to go. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. I think, you know, we'll wrap it up and, uh, you know, deliver our final remarks, but this is a very, uh, complex topic and we just scratched the surface and, you know, this kind of reminds me of the, uh, I remember seeing, you know, a meme of, uh, or you know, even in a video where they show all of the taxes, you know, I, or I guess just a fraction of all the taxes that people pay, gas tax, alcohol tax, cigarette tax, sales tax, gift tax, death tax, <laughs> real estate tax, all these taxes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when you think, uh, or income tax, you think like, nah, that's just, you know, a couple dollars here, a couple dollars there. No, it's not. <laughs> it, it is substantial. So uh, it really puts things into perspective of how much 
control there is in our economy and how not free it is as compared to um, in a couple of other countries. But so, yeah, so I think it's, it's very important. Uh, it's a very important topic for us to discuss with, with people in, in order to introduce the ideas of self-ownership and voluntarism is do you own yourself? Do you own, and if you do, do you own the fruits of your labor? It's a very, very important question. I think, uh, that's a great way because people since childhood, most parents just teach their kids, you know, you just pay your taxes, you know, you, you know, you work, you know, you, they take out taxes and then every year you pay your taxes on the money you earned and it was already taxed, but then you pay taxes again. Or if you're lucky, you get a refund. You <laughs> know, actually I, I was scanning the, uh, the images on your Liberty Defined page and I saw the, the one image of, you know, the alien creature. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and then it has a you know the, the 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 thing that comes out of his mouth with a with a lipstick on it, the kiss, and it uh -huh. says uh -huh. it says government. What does it say? Um, government be like, um, here's your tax refund. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it, it, oh yeah, and it reminds me of another another meme where people are like you know so happy they get a tax refund. It's like it's like it's called intoxication, the euphor <laughs> the euphoric feeling. <laughs> When you when you get the money back that was already yours, but that was just stolen. So I get the same euphoric feeling by sniffing uh, pine saw. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. So yes, yeah, so this is a very vital topic for us to discuss, and uh, I'm sure we will come back to the topic in the future. So tell you what, how about we just ask the audience what part of this topic of the unintended consequences of taxation would they like us to go back to? So if if you think that's a good idea, then we'll just have the mm -hmm. listeners hey, comment in the uh, comment section below. Let us know what uh, part of the unintended consequences of taxation you want us to bring up, a uh, broken window fallacy and the tragedy of the commons or, or whatever it is you'd like us to talk about, or how money is, anything about this, and we'll uh, put that on the docket for a future episode. Yeah. And I mean, I, I intended to talk about, you know, you know, different ways the state derives its income by right? borrowing, uh, you know, taxation is the main way, but there's taxation and there's inflation or money printing and then just borrowing money. Um, but, but taxation is the main one, you know? Yeah. So, so that, that's, a, that's, you know, even more conversation into the idea of money and, and currency and wealth. And so, you know, it's also, maybe we can 10 years worth of a subject to talk about, right? Maybe we can, yeah. Talk about that at different, at different, uh, episodes so yeah so you and any closing remarks you have uh jim all we can do is just take one day at a time one word one mind one generation at a time that's all we can do yes yeah and and i think um you know the fact that we produce this content and just distribute it um for curious minds to discover uh, i think is a great way because too many people i think just go the really hard hitting blunt in your face method and that might work for some small fraction of the population but i think most people would get turned off by that dig their heels into the ground and previously held beliefs ever more tightly so Absolutely. it can be kind of um, counterproductive so that's definitely not my strategy and i think for next episode we're going to uh, look into a little bit more about how to communicate these ideas more effectively when we talk about nonviolent communications. So we'll look forward to that. Well, um, I guess this will conclude this episode here. Uh, I know that uh, we're both working on getting a Patreon set up and we are working on getting merchandising for this here. Uh, the merchandising things that are, uh, they're pretty much set and almost ready. You just have to get uh, pages up for that. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, let's see. What else do we have? Just the Patreon and the uh, the merchandising so far, huh? Right. Yeah. Yeah. For now, I mean, we have the our Patreon uh, individual pages, but yeah, you know, it'd be nice if we can get a Patreon account just for the uh, philosophy of volunteerism specifically, uh, and uh, yeah, so people can donate through there. Maybe I don't know. Maybe through Bitcoin as well. If you're more inclined in the cryptocurrency atmosphere. We can uh, definitely accept that as well. So any any currency, any um, monetary support and monetary compensation is encouraged and appreciated because Jim and I do not do this for the profit motive. <laughs> this is a labor of love. This is a passion that we both harbor for improving the world by spreading ideas 
a peace and volunteerism because I think um, I think we both think that that's what really is important and what's needed. People that do not understand philosophy, economics, and morality and simply act based on false and erroneous beliefs is really is really detrimental and very dangerous to the future of humanity and so we are doing our darndest to educate them and to slowly help people to consider these concepts a little more deeply so so thank you everyone uh for listening this is the um philosophy of volunteerism on peacefinderism.com on theconsciousresistance.com uh, thecsliberty.com and the Voluntary Virtues Network. Um, wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. <laughs>